benefits and potential benefits, avoided costs, really health benefits uh, uh, from biodiversity. So uh, our next speaker is then uh, going to talk about how we trade uh, those particular benefits. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Martine uh, Marin from uh, the University of Queensland and in the School of Geography Planning and she emphasises uh, environmental management. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wouldn't want anyone to think that I knew something about geography or planning, that's all. <laughs> what I am going to talk about is something that, I mean, I've been actually super excited at this conference to find so many people who all care about the same thing. And I think that that thing that we care about is how best to actually manage our natural resources, including our amazing biodiversity in the face of all these pressures that we've been hearing about, what Phil spoke about, the, the sorts of challenges we've been hearing that we're all facing um, over, over the last day and that I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about during the rest of the conference. Um, yeah, every time We know that these things, these pressures are not going away. So we need to grow more food. We need places to put people, places for them to live. Urbanisation will happen. A lot of this is inevitable. Um, so wouldn't it be great if there was a way that we could have it all, if we could not compromise on biodiversity every time we need to use a bit more of the natural world for human purposes? Well, I'm today wanting to talk about the, probably the fastest growing conservation policy approach to doing just that, biodiversity offsetting. Um, but I'm also going to talk about some of the limitations to what it can really achieve. And I thought I'd start by telling a bit of a story about um, about this fantastic bird here. Um, about six, I can't believe I'm saying 16 years ago, but it was 16 years ago I started working on this species, um, the southeastern red-tailed black cockatoo. So a lot of people here know, in fact, a lot of people here are on the recovery team and have also worked on this species with me over the years. This guy is obviously, it's one of, one of your endangered species. It occurs there on the, on the border between South Australia and Victoria. There's only 1,500 of them left. And you know, part of the reason it's threatened is because it's such a picky eater. So only feeds on a couple of different tree species. Um, and I was working on its feeding ecology in um, the uh, big old bull oak trees in the north of its range that now exist pretty much only as like scattered paddock trees surrounded by farmland. And um, every, um, oh, well not every summer, but most summers, a large proportion of the population of the red tails, they move into the north of the range to start feeding on these ancient bull oak trees, um, including on, on our farm, um, just over the border, um, sort of nearish to Narracourt. And this, this is a picture from, from the farm and some of these trees now, they might not be to everybody quite as majestic as the scattered river red gums that are so iconic in that part of the world, but they are rarer and they are just as ancient and they are a lot slower growing too. So effectively, this is um, effectively irreplaceable critical habitat for this threatened cockatoo. And um, so when I was working in that region on, on these birds, I was actually a little bit shocked to receive um, a notification of an application to clear about 120 of these trees on the next door property to ours. Um, <clears throat> I thought, oh, well, this is critical habitat for, for an endangered species. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll write a response to the Victorian Department and I'll uh, advise them that this is irreplaceable critical habitat. That should fix it. <laughs> um, so obviously it didn't. Um, that was a, a long time ago and I was quite naive. But <laughs> it did open my eyes to something that was at the time really quite new. The permit to clear all these ancient trees was approved um, on the basis that the proponent do an offset for that loss. So this offset in this case was actually to direct seed some acacias in the corner of a paddock, which is not so useful for the red tail. They don't feed on acacias. Um, but this was 16 years ago. This was, this was a long time ago. This was early in the, world, in the, in the, in the phase of the uh, development of this idea of trying to offset impacts from development. And we've come a long way since then. Um, but just exactly how far we've come and, and, and what we can really achieve is what I wanted to look at in this talk. 
So to take a step back, I mean, obviously this little story, this is just a little vignette in what is a really big and sort of depressing tapestry of impacts on biodiversity around the world, big impacts, small impacts, all um, adding together to mean that a lot of our biodiversity is just in continual decline. Some of you might recognise this image if you've been following some of what's been going on up in Queensland, where I'm working at the moment, which uh, is, uh, involves um, the, the reversal of a lot of protections of, of native vegetation, and, and so there's been a lot of, a, a lot of large-scale vegetation clearing. So these things are, are, are continuing to happen, but um, at the same time, of course, we're seeing more and more protected areas being gazetted. We're spending money on conservation, um, but this is not changing the fact that the trend is still in the wrong direction. What we need to be thinking about is not how many protected areas that we have or how much we're spending on doing conservation, but where is our biodiversity actually heading? What is the overall net trend? We need to factor in the losses and the gains. We need to start doing net accounting of our biodiversity. Otherwise, we could uh, head a long way in the wrong direction before we've even realised it. So net environmental accounting is something that is becoming increasingly popular. So this idea is really being picked up around the world and in a lot of different ways. So a few years ago, WWF put forward this idea of zero net deforestation, the idea that we've probably gone far enough in losing our environmental assets and we actually need to get to a point where we aren't going to lose any more, at least in net terms. So the word net recognises that the fact is we're always going to keep losing a little bit more. It's hard to envisage a world in which no more damage ever happens anywhere. But that we need to be accounting for each bit of unavoidable residual damage and counterbalancing it with a beneficial impact. So any deforestation needs to be balanced by afforestation somewhere else. And so 60 countries signed on to this pledge to achieve zero net deforestation by 2020. And a whole lot of companies have also signed on to it, you know, in terms of managing um, or achieving zero net deforestation as part of their, um, their production system. Here's, here's an interesting one. I wasn't aware of this this time last year, but um, uh, I've actually just come back from a workshop in Washington where we were, um, a, a part of a, as part of a working group, we're trying to come up with this conceptual framework around this idea of land degradation neutrality. So it's another net concept. It's the idea that we need to start tracking the loss of productive land and degradation of productive land um, so that not only are we trying to minimise it, but that we're actually accounting for any losses that still do happen so that we can try to counterbalance those through targeted restoration. And, um, and this is um, basically at, at last year's conference of parties um, for the UN Convention on Combating Desertification. This was decided to be the way in which that convention is going to try to achieve all of its aims and the sustainable development goal around um, no net land degradation. So here's another example of these, these net terms. And then, of course, there's this phrase, no net loss. No net loss of biodiversity is, is, is something that is being picked up around the world. So here's an example from the EU no net loss um, initiative, which has been debated for the last few years. And the idea that um, even, even if we do everything we can to try to minimise biodiversity loss, some things will happen, but that we can still um, try to balance losses by um, achieving equivalent gains, that what we want to end up achieving is this, is this balancing. And of course, Australia has gotten right into this, and we have a lot of policies that say something like no net loss. Um, we have, um, for example, the COAG approved um, native vegetation framework, uh, which says that we will have, the, the very first goal is that we're going to have an increase in the national extent and connectivity of native vegetation, that's by 2020, and we're going to maintain and improve the condition and the function of native vegetation by 2025. So these are absolute overarching net outcomes. They're not about improving things or, or having more protected areas. These are about net outcomes for biodiversity. Um, and of course, we have recovery, statutory recovery plans that require increases in populations. We have the no species loss pledge in, in South Australia. So there's a whole lot of pledges that have been made um, in terms of these absolute goals. And yet, of course, you know, the story I just told about what was happening with the red-tailed black cockatoo. Well, well that, that was a long time ago, I suppose, but 
actually those sorts of things still happen. So what's the solution? How do we actually operationalise these overall goals of maintaining our biodiversity? Well, offsets are the conservation policy mechanism that's designed to deal with a counterbalancing mechanism. It's the way that we are trying to say, all right, well, with the bit that's, that's still going to be impacted, we've got to come up with something equivalent to counterbalance that so that we don't lose biodiversity in net terms, even if we have to permit some damage. And every state in Australia has at least one policy, uh, policy sometimes more than one policy. Um, but of course, being a bickering federation, we can't all call them the same thing. So we have, yeah, we have policies that aim for no net loss. We have policies that go for improve or maintain, counterbalance significant residual impact, net improvement, equivalent or better, net benefit, significant environmental benefit here in South Australia. So there are a lot of different policies out there, but they're really all just ways of saying the same thing, that we want to have an overall net neutral outcome or better if we permit damage to occur. So this sounds great. It sounds like we've got the overarching goal. We've got the specific policy to try to achieve this overarching goal of no net loss. Um, what's the problem? The problem is that these no net loss in an offset trade is actually not the same thing as no net loss as an overarching policy goal. And I argue that we are mixing up those concepts quite a lot. Um, and um, and that's not very surprising because we're calling them the same thing. When we say no net loss, we assume we mean no net loss, right? But if we don't clarify the difference between what an overarching policy goal for no net loss means and what we get through a no net loss offsets trade, then we are going to end up um, missing out on a lot of, uh, we're, going to miss, we're going to miss a lot of the damage that's being accumulated. So just to, to explain the way the offsets work, you know, there's, there's two ways you can basically get a benefit from, from doing an offset that you could then use to counterbalance an impact. You could have, in the case here, this is a little um, growling grass frog, isn't it beautiful? We, uh, this is um, in the background there, you can see um, an area on the farm that was uh, sort of like a reconstructed wetland. It was originally wetland and it was um, uh, drained decades ago for agriculture. Um, when the drains were stopped back up and some earthworks were done, planted some uh, reeds and so on, and the frogs came back. It's fantastic. So there, was no, there were no growling grass frogs there before. There were afterwards. We created some new biodiversity. That's great. If we wanted to, I guess, we could have sold the credits for um, impact somewhere else. We didn't. But, of course, this is, this is you're probably already thinking, well, well that's, there's um, probably a really super limited variety of biodiversity that you can actually just do that for. That sounds very, very simple. And most, bioda, most biodiversity elements require something much more complicated, let alone trying to put back an entire functioning ecosystem. Most biodiversity offsets, therefore, rely very heavily on what we already have and doing something to increase its protection or maintain it over time. So you might have um, you know, an area of woodland that you, that you put under a covenant and you manage it to make sure that its condition doesn't decline over time. Um, and this is called averted loss offsetting as opposed to sort of restoration offsetting where you're improving something compared to now. Um, so averted loss offsetting, um, this, is, this is where the issues start to arise and you can start to picture why we don't get no net loss of the kind we think we want just through doing offsets. Because if we're allowing averted loss offsets, we're not creating new biodiversity to exchange for losses. We're just trying to say, well, we'll keep what we have and that counts as a gain. And of course that's fair, but it's only fair if we assume that if we hadn't protected it, it was going to disappear. That there was some sort of a background decline that would have occurred if we didn't do the action. So we're making these assumptions about what would have happened if we didn't put that sign on the gate, you know, if we didn't protect it, if we didn't go in and maybe control, um, you know, weeds to stop their spread and so on. Now, of course, in reality, most offsets are a combination of the two. So you might find a place, maintain it, but you may also do some active things that increase its condition. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a um, combination. But the averted loss component, this is the crucial bit to remember. So to give an ex explanation of why 
why no net loss can mean different things in different contexts. Um, I'll show you a bit of a graph. So here's our problem. We've got some type of biodiversity we're worried about. Maybe it's koalas. Oh, that probably makes no sense here. In Queensland, everybody's upset about koalas, that there's not enough of them. Down here, everyone's upset there's too many. So something else. My red-tailed black cockatoos or <laughs> some type of woodland, some type of habitat. It's declining, and it's declining for a bunch of reasons. It's declining because there's... Um, a bunch of impacts on it from feral animals or weed invasion, but also because we're clearing it because it's being impacted by human activity. So there's a whole lot of drivers here. We want to have no net loss. What happens next? Well, it all depends on no net loss compared to what? We introduce our, our offset policy. And if we mean no net loss compared to now, we would expect this to happen. We would expect, well, okay, the decline is stopped. That's the no net loss in the overarching sense. But that's not no net loss in the sense of offsetting an impact. What you have to think about if you're actually trying to offset a specific impact is that all the proponent who does the impact on biodiversity needs to do is just counterbalance the bit of impact that they're responsible for. And not all the other stuff that was just happening cause weed invasion or climate change or whatever, you know, and that's fair. That's not actually part of their responsibility. So if we were actually to assume that even if we didn't do any of these specific developments, stuff's sort of declining anyway. Maybe not as fast because you've taken out some of the impacts, but there's a decline going on anyway, then what happens next is we just match that decline. It's no net loss compared to without the impact or the offsets. It's no net loss compared to what would have happened anyway. That's called a counterfactual scenario. Okay, so it's counterfactual scenario because it's the thing that does not happen but that would have happened if you hadn't done the impact and the offsets. And it starts to sound all terribly sort of you know, like, a, like a, a vague theoretical academic discussion. But of course it's not, because the counterfactual scenario is the outcome you're designing your policy to achieve. <laughs> so actually, the realised net outcome from an impact and an offset exchange is whatever you said that counterfactual scenario is. So all of a sudden, real-world outcomes are being designed by stuff that, by definition, we will never see. <laughs> it's a counterfactual. This is super important um, because, as I say, we are entirely dependent on this counterfactual. To give you a bit of an idea about how this, this, this invisible counterfactual scenario assumption of what would have happened to our biodiversity if we didn't do the impact and the offset, how that drives outcomes on the ground, even if we do the same things. Here's a couple of graphs, right? So on the left, let's say here's where we're going to do an impact to our biodiversity. That's the red line. And the dotted line at the top that bounds that red area, that's our counterfactual. We assume that if we hadn't done that impact, we still would have been losing a bit of biodiversity over time because stuff is happening, you know, there's, there's weed invasion going on or something, or maybe there is permitted clearing, you know, around fence lines and things like that that might have accumulated, right? But um, what we actually did is we clear the lot, so we've got this amount of loss, right? And then at another place, on the other side, we've got a... Um, an amount of gain that we, we achieve by doing whatever this thick line involves. So maybe it involved going to a place where biodiversity was declining a bit, protecting it, improving its condition a little and maintaining it. Fantastic. And again, the benefit from doing that depends on what we think this dotted line is. I'll just assume it's the same at the impact and the offset site, same type of biodiversity. So as long as the amount of red and the amount of green are the same, then we have a fair offset exchange, right? There are obviously complexities here. We, we need to think about things like time lag, uncertainty, definitely. But for simplicity, let's ignore that for now. So loss and the gain, fantastic. That's, that's only the case, though, because, we, because of what we assumed our counterfactual to be. If we do exactly the same thing, we do the same impact, we do the same offset action, it all looks the same to us, but we just assume something different, all of a sudden, it completely changes. We suddenly have an unfair offset exchange. We suddenly have only a tiny amount of benefit and a larger, actually a larger amount of loss too because it wasn't going to decline that much if we hadn't done that work. So um, the problem is that the 
Exchange is entirely sensitive, just as sensitive to the counterfactual as to what we actually do on the ground, what restoration, what protection, what impact. These things are equally real and we really tend to focus on the scenario of restoration or whatever it is we think we can do and influence and we don't tend to focus on the counterfactual. Now, as I say, it's really crucial because if we make up an unrealistic assumption about that counterfactual, that's a big problem because the design of an offset policy is to maintain the counterfactual. And if the counterfactual is decline, if we think that if we did nothing, biodiversity would have declined, which is the assumption every time you allow credit from protecting something that's already there, and all of our offset policies do that. Right? So basically you're, by design, maintaining that same rate of decline. That's what they do. That's what they're designed to do. So that's assuming they work perfectly. It's not, an, it's not a flaw in the way they're implemented. Um, it's what they're meant to achieve. So the loss plus the gain basically maintain, after factoring in some time lags and things, maintain whatever it is that we said was going to happen if we didn't do this offset. So as long as we have averted loss offsets, offsets are not going to achieve no net loss for us in the overarching sense, not on their own. <clears throat> so all of this discussion has been sort of depressing because it's been assuming this background loss of biodiversity. Um, it's assuming that things are going badly if we, if we, don't, if we don't do something specific um, uh, as an offset that was triggered by a particular loss. Um, but what about that stuff that we were talking about at the start? All of these commitments that we've made to actually increase the amount of vegetation in Australia, to recover species. Um, we actually don't believe, do we, that we're just simply going to passively sit back and let biodiversity continue to decline? Is that a realistic counterfactual? And I mean, there can be a lot of argument about whether it is or not, but I suppose um, a really clear-cut example in my mind is the Great Barrier Reef. So the Great Barrier Reef is um, obviously a World Heritage Area. It's internationally significant. And we had a, um, uh, a real scare last year with um, the possibility of it being listed as World Heritage in danger, which would be sort of embarrassing. Um, and so in response, um, Australia made a lot of promises, ironclad promises, to the World Heritage Committee that they would maintain the health of the reef, that they would improve the health of the reef in really specific ways. So we've got really specific targets about the future of the reef that are not just aspirational, let's hope that one day we might find enough money to do this type targets. They are really genuinely intended improvements that we plan to make as a country, regardless of any development impacts that come along in the future. Okay, so they're unconditional commitments. So in this case, it's actually not reasonable to allow a given offset. So say someone comes along and also wants to do some, some coastal development that's going to cause some uh, damage to the quality of water on the reef um, through suspending sediments or something like that. Um, how do they go about offsetting it? If they have to offset that particular bit of damage, they might want to go and invest in some upstream activities to change the amount, to reduce the amount of sediment that that generates so that the overall sediment inflows are neutral. But against what baseline? In this case, the counterfactual scenario should be one of improvement. That you can't just go and change things somewhere and say, well, if we hadn't done that, it wouldn't have changed. Because actually, if you hadn't invested in changing that agricultural practice, it would have changed. It would have had to if we're going to meet these, if we're going to actually meet these commitments, if we're going to keep our promises. So making promises about um, how we're going to improve things actually starts to make offsets um, more difficult, more expensive, because you have to do something over and above um, what would have happened without the offset. And if what would have, would have happened without the offset was actually a lot of improvement anyway, you've got to buy a lot of improvement. It starts to get expensive. And you can imagine that this is obviously not super palatable to people who might end up having to fork out for this, developers and so on. And we were in a meeting last week actually talking about this. And um, um, a guy drew a, a, a gentleman from industry actually drew this pie chart and said, look, it's not fair that this that this counterfactual should be relevant to industry 
um, because you know there's all these other things like there's um, other government investment going into achieving those targets. There's there's um, a best practice industry change anyway. You know there's a lot of stuff like you know fertigation and precision farming and reduced input farming that's happening. And all of those are the things that are going to achieve the targets. This blue bit, the offsets bit. It, 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 it's separate, but it's not. It's not separate. If you picture that there's some trajectory of improvement that we want to be achieving, that we're investing in here, that we're investing in here, that we're investing in here, all of these are working towards this target, but the net outcome from all of these exchanges is negative, then clearly there's a, um, there's a shortfall. And somebody has to pick up the cost of that shortfall. The shortfall falls to the public, and so it's an, it's an unfair cost shifting if we're expecting industry to pay the full costs of the damage that they do relative to the counterfactual. And importantly, I mean, this is assuming that offsets are a real, a deal with a really small range of impacts. If offsets deal with a lot of impacts, then you can imagine how significant this trend, this net trend, starts to be in driving overall system trends. So that's why it's really important. I mean, New South Wales at the moment is talking about um, expanding offsets to um, apply to a much larger range of impacts. And I think this is actually part of the solution. If you had to offset every single thing, that doesn't leave too much left over that society has to pick up the cost for in terms of general impacts. But it does mean that um, if we are planning to actually, uh, it, it, basically it means that there's not a lot of other losses that wouldn't themselves have to be offset that we could avert by doing an offset you know, to, to, generate, to generate credit. I guess the way to illustrate it is probably this. I mean, what we need to be doing, um, because you know, on the one hand, it looks like this is a problem, a, a, a trajectory that's positive that we all want, limits offset opportunities and increases their costs. But it's also the solution, because if that is what we want, we plan it, and then we set the offsets up so that they are also achieving the same thing. So the idea being that if we've got some target trajectory for our biodiversity that we're committed to achieving, our counterfactuals that we're using may be in the early stages fair enough to assume decline. But as we go, we get further and further away from being able to say, well, I've protected that and I get credit for that because otherwise it would have disappeared. Otherwise it wouldn't have disappeared because we're doing the work towards our target trajectory. We move from a situation where offsets start out averting loss, and in the end, the main credit we can get is just from doing restoration, from improving things, creating biodiversity that wasn't there before. Um, so I'm going to get something thrown at me if I go on any further, so I'll finish there. Thanks very much. It's always useful to learn a new word uh, at conferences, so counterfactuals is my new word. Uh, questions? One question. As a consultant working in Queensland for five years on gas and coal and urban development, Projects have been exposed to a change in offset policies where previous they used to have multipliers for certain uh, conservation status remnant regional ecosystems. I can't remember exactly what they were, but then it went to a change in to now it's more of an ecological equivalence thing. But now like in Queensland there's three categories, least concern, of concern and endangered. But for Petroleum Act projects, there's an exemption for clearing um, least concern. So for gas projects, you can clear as much old growth iron bark spotted gum for us as you like with no offset. And these are very old systems and very fragile soils. And even if, for argument's sake, they were to offset that, there's going to be a 50 year lag or so before we have sufficient hollows and there's an immediate habitat loss which cannot be offset at all. Those species, fauna species, are in urgent and immediate decline with nowhere to go. And I think for Queensland, it's time to stop 
logging and playing with remnant forest and if offset policies are to be developed in Queensland that are useful, I think they need to just start dealing with the, the high value regrowth system there and playing with that and using that as the currency rather than keeping on with playing with the remnant systems. A really interesting thing, Queensland's a great example because um, you had this situation where uh, vegetation, native vegetation that was remnant was protected and high value regrowth was protected and then it was deprotected which opened up all these opportunities for farmers to use it as offsets and that was actually at the time seen as a good thing. Missing the whole point, I think. Um, yes, Queensland is clearing 300,000 hectares of vegetation a year at the moment. It's a little bit awkward to see how we're going to achieve that um, increase in vegetation extent by 2020 if we keep doing that. <laughs> okay, thanks. thanks. Uh, but uh, please join me in thanking our speaker.